You're listening to Pro Community, a Socius podcast, the show where online community meets business performance. Episode number nine of Pro Community, Socius's social business podcast, the show where online community meets business performance. As always, you can find past episodes of Pro Community at Socius.com, as well as on iTunes, where five-star ratings and positive reviews are appreciated. I'm Josh Paul. I'm very pleased to have with me today someone who I trust and respect in the areas of organizational management social business, and culture change, Jamie Notter. Welcome, Jamie. Thanks. Glad to be here. Jamie's the vice president at Management Solutions Plus and co-author of the book Humanize on how people-centric organizations thrive in a social world. And I think that's very relevant to uh, the online community, the shift we're seeing towards online communities in the business world. So, Jamie, I want to thank you for being on the show. And before we get started and, and talk about uh, some of the, the breakthrough ideas in the book, I want to talk about what, what are the changes in the business landscape and, and in the market and the way that people interact that are requiring companies to change the way, change in the ways that you describe in Humanize? Well, uh, I mean, what we identified when we were writing the book is, is fundamentally some of the changes that are just happening in the world of social media. Okay, so social media, um, you know, I, I guess it's almost boring now to talk about how amazing social media is and the growth and Facebook getting 200 million users in nine months. And my, the latest one I put up there is, you know, Google Plus, I think, got 20, made it to 25 million unique visitors in two months. Like their first two months, it took them two months to get to 25 million users. Um, and, and honestly, Google Plus is kind of lame, right? So I, I don't understand how this growth happens, but it's, it's running circles around our organizations, right? Our organizations are not uh, succeeding at that level. And so Maddie and I looked around and said, well, why is this? And the, our conclusion was that, you know, social media is growing so fast because it lets people be people. Right? It, it taps into what makes us human. I mean, even though there's a bunch of activity in social media that is inane, the, the classic, what did, you know, what did people have for lunch that they're posting in these, in these sites? Um, but there's so much in social media that lets us create and share and learn that is innately human activity. Right? We, we are coded to do that and to want to do that. And once we get a little taste of it, particularly because we can do it now on our own without the help of third-party institutions, um, we're running with it. Uh, and that's really powerful. And so it's not even that, that the, the business landscape has changed that much. It's just that suddenly I'm seeing all this potential that we're letting languish by not taking advantage of that same power. And in fact, the way we run organizations, it works. It's just, you know, we're not nearly reaching our potential, and, and social media, sh- you know, shine the light on that. I just returned from a, uh, the inbound conference up in Boston where Gary Vaynerchuk brought down the house talking about those same mm. concepts where, you know, it's not okay, and, and, you know, and it's increasingly not okay to do business the way that we've been doing business because the way that people are interacting and people's uh, you know, barometers as far as what is marketing and what is human is uh, growing at exponential speeds. Mm-hmm. Well, now the other piece that, that, that we concluded as we did the research for the book, I mean, we, we, we came from the social media world. That's where we were sort of working in and that's where, so we knew, I guess we were sort of the early adopters. So we already concluded that social media had some things to teach us. Um, 
but what we really didn't realize until we got down and wrote the book is we, you know, we took a hard look at the way we run our organizations. I mean, if we're going to say social media is going to teach us some new things for how we manage, then we had to do an assessment of, of how we manage. And uh, that turned out to be not such good news. Like, I mean, our conclusion is that management is failing ridiculously. I mean, it, it sounds, you know, sensationalist, I guess, but, um, you know, we haven't, we haven't innovated management in 50 or 100 years. We're literally using the same management processes that, that my parents and my grandparents used. Like, that alone should cause us to, to look around and say, what are we doing? So why is now the time to change? Why, why not five years from now? Why not five years ago? Well, I, I think the time, well, I, I would say it was five years ago and it was 10 years ago. Um, I think the reason why we're figuring it out now is because, in general, the pace of change has sort of crossed a tipping point, I think. But things move so fast. Our technology has allowed us all to do things so fast on such a huge scale that if we don't keep up with it, things are going to start breaking. So it, ten year, five years ago, ten years ago, well, definitely ten years ago, not keeping up with change didn't cause things to really break a lot. It maybe frustrated us, but we didn't lose. We didn't lose out to competition that, that leapt in front of us. We just sort of were not as far ahead as we could have been because it didn't work. So that low-level frustration we've been putting up with, um, I don't think we can do that anymore. Um, has, has, the, has consumer social media and public social media impacted employees and customers and partners' expectations of how fast and collaborative and open communication should be? Well, I think, I think so in the sense that, again, like I said before, once people get a taste of this, they don't want to not have it anymore. Okay, And once you get a taste of instant customer service, then you, the bar has been raised, whether it was intentional or not. Right. Um, and, and I think that's true internally as well. Once people realize they can be just as productive working at home, they're going to want that all the time, and you're going to have to change the way you design your workspace. You know, those, those qu and again, I think this, th there was a need for this 10 or 15 years ago. It just didn't manifest itself because people couldn't come to these conclusions on their own so quickly. Now they can, and they're running with it. So creating this, this type of culture means a, a commitment to change. That's uh, one of the, the overt writing themes in the book. What are some of the shifts that you're seeing businesses having to make uh, to build this type of culture? Well, uh, in, in the book, we identified sort of four basic human elements. Um, these are elements that we think have been driving social media's success and growth. That's why we picked them. But we also think these are aspects of being human that we're attracted to as people. So it's going to have that same energy and that same attraction that social media had. Um, and they're open, trustworthy, generative, and courageous. Um, and so... Within each one of those, we talk about implications for changing your culture. Like an open organization uh, is one that sort of that embraces decentralization, just like social media did. Uh, social media got its power by activating the periphery and not demanding that the center control as much. That's how it got to be so fast and so big and so powerful as it did that. Um, so our challenge to organizations is we'll take a look at your, your company. How can you shift uh, decision-making power? Or how can you shift voice um, from the center out to the periphery? You don't have to give up all the control. I know that makes people nervous when I talk about decentralization. Um, but look for ways to do it. That's a culture shift to suddenly let your employees decide where they're going to work or what they're going to work on, at least for a part of their time, like Google does. Um, <clears throat> It's going to be a shift to let people who are not the top of the hierarchy make the presentations to the management team or to the board or to the customer group because it gives that person in the middle level of the hierarchy, gives them power. It gives them, you know, it engages them, makes them want to do more for the organization when they have that voice. These are cultural shifts that, that I think the smart organizations are moving towards. Um, so more, more and more communication and, and collaboration is incurring, 
that is occurring online and in social networks and in online communities? What are some examples of these people-centric organizations? Um, a couple of my favorite, uh, maybe my, my single most favorite is, um, is W.L. Gore and Associates. And so these are the folks that make Gore-Tex. Um, so they're scientists and it's all, you know, chemistry and, and fabric and, um, and coatings. And they moved into guitar strings and, and I think bike cables and they, they do lots and lots of work. Um, they're my favorite example of a decentralized culture. They have two titles in their entire organization. They have thousands of employees worldwide. Well, maybe three titles. They do have a CEO. But after that, you're either an associate or a leader. Okay? Those are the only two titles. There's no deputy undersecretary for, you know, like it's associate and leader. And the leader title is given to you by your associates. Okay? One of, one of the phrases is if you convene a meeting at Gore and people show up, then you might get the leader title. Um, but it is given to you by your associates and it's taken away by the associates as well. Um, when people are brought into to Gore, they are given a sponsor. The sponsor takes them around to different teams and they get to know each other. And so the associate has a, a voice in deciding where they're going to work in the organization. Okay, this is, that's, that's more radical decentralization even than I say is necessary. But it's a great example um, of, of empowering and not in a, you know, I empower you as your, as your master kind of thing, but really accessing the power of the periphery in a decentralized system because that's what enables them to thrive. They, and I mean, you can, Gore has never posted a loss in their history, okay? And they, they, they moved into to, to markets like guitar strings where they didn't have any foothold and they dominated them. Okay, so this is a remarkably successful company. It's sort of one of the points that I like to make. We're not advocate, advocating sort of humanized just because it feels good and everyone gets sing kumbaya. Um, the examples that we give are concrete ones where companies are making more money and being more successful by applying these techniques. So it's, uh, uh, it's all about better results, in my opinion, not just about sort of humanistic values. I, th I think that's really an, an important point, and it's something that you stick to throughout the book, tying it back to performance, and, and that's you know, wh whether it's cost control, whether it's product increasing productivity, increasing uh, uh, sales and retention by by improving customer relationships. Now, I work in the world of online communities, and uh, specifically online communities that bring customers, employees, and partners together for the success of the customer and in turn the success of the uh, company. And I w wanted to ask you on the show today to talk about the, the management and leadership and cultural frameworks for building these type of collaborative environments. And I, I want to start by asking, you know, what are organizations getting wrong about social media and online communities? Sometimes flipping the question to the negative uh, is pretty informative for our, our listeners. Um, what are you seeing out there where people are not getting it right? I, maybe a, a, a generalization, but when, they, when, when companies are engaging, sort of expanding into that area, I find that they still want to control. I mean, that was, a, that was always a social media mantra for me, was clarity over control, right? That, that you, can't, you can't run social media and you can't run a collaborative online network that, that crosses these boundaries, right, with customers and different departments. All, all these boundaries are going to be crossed. You can't run that and, and control it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's impossible. It's not how that works. But our management regime is based on control and based on if you're out of control, it's a problem and you'll be punished. So we look for ways to control it. So we limit it. So we don't share information. Um, I want to, you know, I want to create this, this open online community. But if a customer asks a question that makes anyone uncomfortable, don't answer it. Right? You, you're going to fail if that happens. Right? I mean... The entire, you can't invite them in and then say, but you can only do X, Y, and Z because that makes us happy. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the points that you, you made earlier you, yeah, it is you, know, you need to let humans be humans. 
and I, I like that, and I'm going to create bumper stickers now. Awesome. Uh, I, will, I will buy one. I, I'll, send, but, I'll send you one. <laughs> no, I, the, 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 the part of the issue is around fear. We're, we're, we're setting up these new systems, and that makes people nervous because it's new, it's uncharted, we haven't done it before. It doesn't work. It doesn't feel like the other stuff we've done. And so when the fear uh, comes up, then people, again, tighten control, pull back, uh, don't share information. The transparency one is huge for me. Um, if, if you are going to if you, if you want to break down those, those walls, right? So if you're actually taking these boundaries that we used to accept, that the customers over there and that, that we are the employees are on this side, the organization on this side, or that the marketing department has its boundaries and no one will cross it and you know product development is over here and that, that's, that's all it is. Whenever you break those boundaries, you are asking people to work together in new ways, which means you need to have trust. Okay, if there's not trust in that situation where there are these new relationships, then again, people get scared, and when they get scared, they clamp down, and they control, and they hide, right? So you have to learn how to be transparent. You have to learn how to shift your, your processes when you create this community so that people speak the truth, right? Even if it's uncomfortable, even if I'm not sure where this is going to lead, you have to say the truth. When you do that, you are building trust. When you build the trust, then you then you can tap into the power that that is inherent in this design, right? So you're starting with the premise that do it. Hey, we're going to put all these people in this community. It's going to be awesome. Productivity is going to go up. Customer service is going to be better, right? Like these are the promises. In order to get those promises, you have to have trust. In order to have the trust, you got to change your processes. You got to change your actual behavior, right? Uh, the, the the key behavior change when it comes to trust is authenticity. Right, which we learned, which I learned from social media. Social media allowed people to be themselves, and they like it. It didn't have to be just the corporate marketing message. And so when that gets out there, that's powerful. That means I, you know, I know I can trust you if I see you, and I get that it's you. Um, but our traditional management practices don't. Not that they don't allow for that, but it's it's shocking to them. You know, like. Why would you have to be you? I just need you to do your job. Uh, and so that's where you actually have to make conscious changes in the way you do things because then you'll get sort of what you were promised. I, I think that's a good point. And, and it you know, goes to the other, one of the other pillars in the book, and, and that's being courageous because what you just described is a massive cultural shift. So you brought up transparency, and, and I want to... You know, in reading the book again in preparation uh, for our conversation today, I, I drew from it some common questions that I hear from uh, some of the, the businesses and associations that, that we work with to build communities. And I want to get your take on these these common hesitations. Mm -hmm. So, so the first one's transparency. Uh, you know, on the level of the em employee, and this is something I, I bring up a lot. You know, it, employees who it, they don't want their work seen when it's half baked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I struggle with it personally. Uh, you know, when I worked for a big company, you want it to be because you, know, you don't want your career and, and quality of work to be judged. Uh, you know, for future opportunities based on something somebody saw that, or it was just at the beginning of the brainstorming stages. What do you say to that? Well, um, I don't know. I've been a consultant too long, so I say it depends. Um, there's definitely, like, when we talk about transparency, we're not advocating for, for a radical, complete transparency. It's, it's not that there aren't reasons to not share things, because there, there are reasons to not share things. Like, if I tell you what I'm working on when it's not done, you will, I mean, if I literally just... If I sat with my project team and said, well... I'm really not sure where this is going, but but I, I think it's going here, here, and here. There are times when that can be useful, but you know, you'll know that there are times where that will just take people off on rabbit hole chases, right? I mean, we're just it'll you'll go around and around in circles because it's just not complete enough to 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 get 
focused feedback on. Um, going too far is wait till it's totally done and then get feedback on it and realize, wow, there was a bunch of things we could have fixed. So it's a little bit about finding the sweet spot. Um, I would argue that in general, organizations err on the side of waiting too long. So when I, when I push for transparency, it's because I know they're already too far towards the opacity uh, standard. Um, but I don't think it's about radical transparency. I don't think it's about sharing everything all the time. I don't want to hear what everyone's thinking all the time. <laughs> right, you'd never get any work done. No, I, yeah, I can't give feedback on every step of the way. Um, so it's more, uh, for me, it's more about prepare yourself to share more than you're used to. Prepare, to sh prepare yourself to share more than you're going to feel comfortable with. Because we've developed a certain comfort around not being judged. Uh, and, I mean, we talk about courageous in the book, which is ultimately about experimentation, right? So, it, you know, it, when you experiment, you're still sort of sharing the results of your experiment, or you do something and then you get feedback on it. So it's not like they'd see everything, but it is about being conscious. What, what experiments can I build along the way so I learn from it? As opposed to our sort of American individualistic ideal of I'm just going to do this and get it done and deliver the, the final product it's going to be awesome and I'm going to be the hero. Um, figure out how to build experimentation and learning into it. The, the individual behavior piece of that is around sort of the emotional intelligence of being okay with being judged. <laughs> like being okay with getting feedback being sort of a, a, a developed enough human being that I can go out there and be vulnerable. Because if I can't be vulnerable, first of all, no one's going to trust me, um, but I'm not going to learn, right? So the, the, we put courageous last on the four elements because I think it's the hardest, and we put that personal development piece at the, at the end because it's like if you really want an, an organization full of individuals that can do what we say in the book, you need to give them time to work on themselves, you know, to develop that emotional strength, to be able to handle critical comments, and to put stuff out there when it's not fully done, and 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 not get defensive about it. Um, so that long term is stuff that we need to develop in order to make all this stuff work. I think. And I think that that makes a sense, and that that gives permission, you know, people permission to be transparent, but it also gives people permission that it's okay if you're not completely transparent. And I think uh, you, know, you have to work with your business and your customers and your employees and find that right balance. Another common question I get is uh, appropriateness. You know, who should interact with customers? Who should be trusted to give the appropriate response to something you know, or to interact responsibly with a customer or to, with a board member? Um, how, do, how do you handle that? Um, well, with that one, I go back to the clarity over control answer um, in the sense that, and maybe this is just my sort of, uh, I've been immersed in social media so long that the, that the who question, I ignore. Who? The answer is everybody. Uh, I mean, Clay Shirky's book, Here Comes Everybody. Everybody can do this now. Once they want, once they learn they can do it, they will. So once employees learn that they can express themselves, I think they will. So who is appropriate to do it? Everybody. Are, are there some things that should be said and some things that shouldn't be said? Yes. How do you know what that is? You know that through clarity. We are not good at giving everybody a really clear set of principles about how to interact, what's important, and what's, what's dangerous and why. Right. I mean, you know, Maddie talks about this a lot because in, in her social media consulting, they do social media policies. And that was one of their main conclusions is you don't need a 300 page policy manual on social media that says, here's what you can do and here's who can say what. And if this person says this, you respond this way. It's about clear principles that say we can't tell you the answers, but we can tell you what matters to us and why that you can't share information about um, our strategic direction until it's been released officially. 
because that's we have competitors that we're worried about. So these kinds of strategic things are off limits, generally speaking. These kinds of things are fine. Here's how you know. Here's who you go to if you have a question. Sort of clearer principles that says that stuff's really significant. Um, and, that, and that takes trust. Yes. You know, so, so it really it's all trust. ties together. You know, set, it, set the direction and let people delight you with their uh, ability to yes. find a way to make it happen. I mean, we sort of laugh because people say, well, now if everybody, that makes everybody a spokesperson for the company, you know, and how am I going to keep all those people on message? You know, what if somebody says something wrong? What if somebody says something that is inaccurate uh, in this day and age of, of political campaigns? I can't imagine that ever happening, somebody saying something inaccurate. Um, <clears throat> And you know, they're worried about loss of control, and, and, and how do I handle that? And my response is, okay, if you've got a thousand people now being your voice, if one or two of them get it wrong, it's going to be drowned out by the other 998 that get it right. Whereas if you have only one spokesperson and they get it wrong, you're done. <laughs> There's more of a risk in putting all your eggs in that one spokesperson basket than in ter opening it up to the masses because the right message comes through. Um, again, it comes through quicker when you provide the clarity, right? When you provide those principles and dig down um, and to, to figure out what's important and what's not and to understand why. I think that's, it's just such a massive cultural shift. And that's one of the things that came across when I was going through the book again. I mean, it, it is the size of the change. How do you handle those you know, type of hesitations from executives. Yet yeah, this is great. I can decide to do this, but who's going to come along? And and how do I? You know, if I'm I have a 500 or 1,000 person organization, even a 100 person organization. How long does it take? You know, can it take? And and how how do I do this? Well, I mean, I I'm of two minds about it. I think I. I mean, the short answer is there's no one path you know, to humanizing. So th there's a lot of ways to do it. I think you can, I think you can go all in and say, I want to move in this direction. And, and you can actually follow a fairly traditional path to that. You can say, all right, well, let me, do, let me assess my strengths uh, on these sort of four elements and, and, and create, you know, a, a portfolio of change efforts, right? That, and this is not our idea, this is McKinsey's, but they've talked about it for years in terms of change. You know, you want some short-term wins, you want some long-term projects, you want some stuff that's familiar to you so that you can get it done. You want some other stuff that's a little more risky. You want to balance that, like an investment portfolio. You don't want to be, you know, all in one one area or not. And you can just launch it. I think it takes time. Um, it depends on the, I don't know, it depends on how entrenched your culture is. But I don't think you have to do it that way either. I think there are plenty of opportunities to just start changing it one aspect at a time. Okay, so if you have silos that fight, right, that are in conflict, you can address that. Now, that's going to be getting, so you're like, ah, oh, I got these departments, they're not getting along. So redesign some processes. It's not hard to say, well, then I want these two departments to meet once uh, a month and work out their issues, and I want them to report back to me. I mean, that's still in a traditional hierarchy, right? I mean, I'm a boss telling my people what to do, and you just you change their process a little. You have them have some meetings that they're not having. You have employees design the agenda, not the managers, a couple of times. You experiment with little things in the process that you change. As you do that, make sure you pay attention to what's changing, whether it, it sort of fits with what we're talking about in the book or not. I'm arguing that it will. But you start doing those things, those, those process and behavior changes are the foundation of cultural change. Okay? If you really want to do the culture change, you've got to do some deep thinking about it. You've got to challenge your assumptions. I mean, it's, it's more than just process and behavior, but it starts there. So you can pick any single process you want to work on and just solve that problem. Right? If you get a problem with silos that are in conflict, solve that problem. But do it in a way where when you're done and people are like, it's much better now. These departments are getting along and, our, and you know, our, our productivity has increased. Our efficiency is better. I'm, I'm psyched. Say, so, yeah, exactly, because 
This is what I was talking about in the meeting the other day about systems thinking, that we need to be better at understanding the dynamic complexity here. And the only way we can do that is that these two departments are working together. And you just reinforce the message later. And so it'll be, I think it'll be one of those cases where you'll look back and everyone will have been working to solve all these problems and they will and they'll be happy about it. And at the end of the day, they'll say, hey, we became more human. We just didn't call it that. Uh, it's kind of like social media. At this point, you don't even use the word social media. You just say, hey, I'm now, I've got this new way to collaborate with people outside our organizational boundaries. Can we do it? Sure. <laughs> you know, you, just, you don't scare them with the words. So I, I think we'll end up backing into it if we are conscious about what problems we solve. I think that's a useful perspective on how to get started. There's a lot of you know, executives who, can, who like the ideas in the book and like what can relate to what you're saying, but they're just looking for where to begin. And uh, does this have to start at the top, this, this kind of cultural shift, or can it uh, be driven by anyone in the organization? Um, I am, that's almost like a philosophy question. I, I, I hear people take different stances on it. I'm a, you don't have to start at the top guy. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that you're only going to go so far, and if you don't involve the top, uh, the people at the top have a lot of power. So why not engage them? Because they're powerful people. So uh, I don't want to ignore them. Um, but when it comes to solving problems and changing processes and, and shifting behaviors, anybody can do that. Anyone can work on that. I mean, this, you know, at the very end of the book, we, uh, we cite uh, the Heath Brothers book, Switch, which is about change, and they have their little metaphor of you're either direct, you know, an elephant and a rider. You're either directing the rider who's sitting on top of the elephant, or you're motivating the elephant, you know, the emotions and that kind of stuff. The directing the rider is about clarity. That's good for the top of the org chart. Um, motivating the elephant is about getting people to make change based on a gut reaction to it as opposed to just in their head. I like that one for middle managers because... Middle managers can logic you to death, but no one's going to change. You know, you're never going to get the top and the bottom to listen to you using logic only. You got to get at the middle, and then. But the last one is shape the path. Okay, if you can't control the elephant or the rider, then at least cut down some trees over in this direction. The elephant's going to naturally want to walk there, right? And so, when you're at the bottom of the organizational chart, if you lack sort of the control aspect of your job, you still have your behaviors. You know, if you're in that department, just start sending your data to the other department. Don't ask for permission. Uh, you know, one of our mottos in the book is proceed until apprehended. Um, so just start changing your work behavior. Keep sending them the data. In the beginning, they might be confused. Why is this guy sending me this data from the other department? I didn't ask for this. My boss didn't ask me to get this. But if they start looking at it, maybe it'll help. Maybe they'll start asking some questions. Maybe you'll have avoided a problem you've been hitting for the last six months because you did that. You sort of shaped the path and made it easier to walk down that collaborative path or that transparency path um, by doing it. So you're certainly limited when you're not at the top. You can't do everything, but you can always do something. I think that's good. I mean, the, the book is really a practical guide to, you know, it, it's not pie in the sky. It's not too much theory. It, it's here's how you can make this transformation. And in the show notes, I'll, I'll link to you have some good starter um, worksheets on the book website to help people figure out where to begin and, and some small steps that, that they can take. Yeah, Matt, Maddie and I are, are inherently activists. You know, if you're not doing something differently because of this book, then we're bummed. Like, we're glad you bought the book. That's nice. But, uh, and we're even happier if you read it. But we want you to do something with it. Um, and that's why we created the worksheets. And since the, the book came out, we also created an online assessment. So it's 15 minutes. You can assess your own organization, 60 questions on a scale of 1 to 10. And it'll spit back a little report that says, here's how you're doing in open, trustworthy, generative, and courageous. So because the, the, the worksheets do that, but on one issue at a time. And we got feedback. People wanted to, to, to get a, a snapshot of the whole thing. So there's also a link to that on the, on the website. Perfect. I think a lot of uh, the people watching this video and listening to this podcast will find that useful. Um, so one of the favorite 
con one of my favorite concepts in the book is uh, that that those in power uh, have a responsibility to use their their power to help people get their jobs done and protect the culture that's going to help people um, you know protect the community or protect people's ability to to collaborate and and get their jobs done just I'm a big fan of the the whole idea of servant leadership and uh, especially in online communities and offline communities protecting the community and protecting the culture is really important so when you're speaking to executives at uh, a conference or in a workshop what is the you know that that's my favorite idea in, in the book but what is the one concept or one takeaway that you want people to walk out of the room with um well it's hard for me to boil it down to one and it does vary depending on the audience but inherent i mean related to the point that you just brought up inherent in the book and it is mentioned i forget where now maybe towards the end um is a definition of leadership that i don't think is is commonly shared okay we define generally speaking people the definitions of leadership are all over the place so that's why there's you know a thousand books on leadership published every every year but it tends to be hierarchical leadership is about people is about the top of the org chart um, and it's about what those people do it's about what those people who have all the power do because they are worth more since they have all the power and I, I use Peter Senge's definition of leadership, which is leadership is the system's capacity to shape its future. Okay? So any system, like an organization, has a capacity to shape its own future. That's what leadership is. So if you have strong leadership, then you get to make decisions that impact your own future and sort of take you where you want to go. That's, right? If you don't have leadership, then stuff just happens to you. You don't shape anything. Future just whatever, right? So there's a role for people at the top of the organizational chart. They're part of that capacity. But so is everybody else. So, I mean, I look at online communities, like it's, such, it's got such potential for increasing the capacity of the whole system to shape its own future when you can engage customers in your strategy process. Right, which you didn't do before because you didn't want to, sh you didn't want them to see. Right, when you can, when you can get the different parts of the system to share information before the problems, you know, happen. Like that's a capacity that helps you shape your future. So I'm in agreement that that people at the top of the org chart, we used to think that they're about directing and controlling and sort of making things happen. Um, and you want to make things happen, then create an environment where everyone else can make stuff happen because there's there's we're already using frankly we're using our executives almost to their limit now what do we do to make them work harder i think executives work way too hard as it is uh the power that we're not tapping into isn't at the top it's in the middle and at the bottom and so i think the organizations that figure out how to how to tap into that are the ones they're going to run, run circles around everybody else i completely agree and i think you know that connection that is a very strong connection to the performance of an organization. And I think you know, there's a lot in, of people in the uh, social business, non online community world that w would agree with you and build on that idea uh, that you just laid out. So Jamie Nodder, I want to thank you for your time and uh, your insight and your sharing your experience today. Before we wrap up, where can people find you on the web? So the, all the book information is at humanizebook.com. Um, and then my blog is getmejamienotter.com. Um, but the, the, all the contact information is on the book site as well. And uh, again, the worksheets are there. Those are free. And the, uh, the assessment is also, uh, individual assessment is up there for free. Great. And the book is Humanize. We'll link to uh, Jamie's blog, the book website, and, and where you can uh, purchase the book in the show notes. And all, as always, you can find all of the episodes of Socius's podcast, Pro Community, at Socius.com, as well as on iTunes in audio format, so you can listen to it on your run or on your commute home or uh, in church, wherever you want to listen to it. 
Uh, we appreciate five-star ratings and great reviews. And Jamie, I want to thank you once again and have a great day. All right. Thanks for having me.